Welcome. Uh, this talk is how Maps API v3 came to be. Tips, tricks, and lessons learned in developing a cross-platform desktop and mobile API. Uh, my colleague, oh, before I start, I would like to remind you that we will have, um, you can follow live notes and ask questions about this session on Google Wave at this highly intuitive bit.ly URL here, CN capital Q I O K. Um, so I'm Susanna Robb. I am a developer on the Google Maps API v3. This is my colleague, Mark Rede. Okay. And the real star of the show is the Maps API v3, who graduated from labs just yesterday. So big congratulations to, to our little marker friend here. <laughs> and we're going to share with you today things that we've learned in developing this API so that it runs well on both desktop and mobile devices. This really was designed first for mobile. The whole point of the project was to work well on mobiles. So we're going to start by talking about latency, the impact of it, the causes of it, defining it, reducing it, then share with you our architecture we've used mostly to combat latency. I'll then hand it over to Mark to share with you some of the technologies that we've studied and used in developing this to work on each platform. And I'll also talk some about debugging on our dear mobile devices. So in getting started, I'm going to share with you some background on why, we are, why we're here today. With the experience of the, uh, the Maps API one year ago. So taking you back to April 2009, this is your map. I'll stop it there. And um, so after about 17 seconds, we finally have finished downloading 175 kilobytes of uncompressed JavaScript, and four if we're very lucky, but normally six images to render that map. In those 17 seconds, if I was better prepared, I could have gone, made a coffee, maybe come back, but probably I'd found something else to do. Not a very good user experience. This is really what we call latency. Let me back up and define it first. There are a few kinds of latency. First, there's user perceived latency. This is the time until the page appears to be usable. In our case, this is when the map tiles, the map imagery, has loaded. At this point, the user can look at the map and start processing what's happening. It seems to be usable. Next is page ready time. This is when it really is usable. And this, for us, is when the, the map is zoomable and draggable, so when the user can actually interact with it. And we separate these because the, the user can start to figure out what they're going to do with the page. It takes a moment to process what's going to happen, what they're going to do before they actually start doing it, before they start dragging. Preferably, we want, though, that, that draggable, that zooming capability to be there when they actually start to, to use it. Then there's page load time, and this is the time until all elements are present. We've really focused on reducing user perceived latency and the page ready time. Uh, the page load time, what we consider in there is having all the controls loaded, being able to load other things like directions and, and other components of the map. On the desktop, we can measure latency using tools like HTTP Watch in both Internet Explorer and Firefox. It gives us a breakdown of each request how much time it takes, where the time is spent between waiting for the server, downloading, um, whether the, the request has been processed by the cache or not. And it's really given us a good understanding, and we've been able to optimize a lot of things over the years uh, since the beginning of Maps and, and, the, and V2, Maps API V2, by using tools like HTTP Watch to understand the sources of latency. But for any of you who have developed on mobile, you're probably well aware that desktop and mobile just aren't the same. There's different causes of latency on the mobile, and we need different tools to measure it. There's, we can take what we've learned from the desktop and apply a lot of it to mobile devices, but not all of it. So for, the, uh, for understanding why it was taking 17 seconds to load the API, we had to set up a new system to do that. 
not just using HTTP watch. We noticed that loading the map took a really long time, not just over the 3G network that has high latency, but also over wireless. So we knew that it wasn't just the network speed that was impacting the speed of our, our map loading. So to figure out what was going on, we used the iPhone configuration tool and were able to connect via a proxy server we had running outside of our corp network so that we could access it on the 3G network. We have a Fiddler proxy running on that server that all requests go through and that we can watch in Fiddler what's happening with each request. So this graph that I'm showing you, this chart that I'm showing you here is the breakdown of the Maps API v3 loads. So you can see between lines three and four, this is the time that our big JavaScript file is downloading. It's not 175 kilobytes uncompressed anymore, but it's still, this is the time that it's loading, it's parsing, it's executing before we begin to download our static imagery. So what did we find? We found that there is some overhead in downloading or in parsing, loading and parsing each JavaScript file plus some amount of time it takes to parse and load it based on its size. So this chart is showing you that uh, as the file size increases, the amount of time to, to load and parse is increasing, but the network time isn't necessarily, um, it, it's reflected in that, but we don't believe that that's the, the major source here. We believe it's time taken on the phone, that it's due to the limited CPU resources for, the, for this JavaScript to parse. It is very dependent though on the hardware and the OS. So I have two charts here, one on, some older, on an older iPhone running a slightly outdated OS. And we see that the time decreases on newer hardware on a newer OS. The important thing here though is that this is much improved from last year where we were seeing a bigger overhead and a bigger time uh, that milliseconds per kilobyte load and parse time. So things are improving. But with discovering that the size of the JavaScript really matters, that we really see this, this linear increase, potentially even exponential increase um, in, this, in parsing, loading and parsing larger files, we needed to reduce the size. And we were doing this, but for, for you writing your applications, you can use the compilers that exist to greatly reduce your code size. They optimize for code size reduction by doing things like obfuscating property names. So you can continue to use your beautiful, readable, verbose, well-named, good style, variable names, uh, but not have that impact the size of your final download by using a compiler that's going to make them all short, make them A and B and C. The compilers also are a fantastic thing for error checking and for helping you use good practices in writing your JavaScript. Some of these that exist are Clojure, GWT, the Google Web Toolkit, as well as a number of other ones that you can find out more about online. The other thing that they do is many of them have built-in module or fragment systems that will split your, your JavaScript into multiple components so that you can download only the parts that you need instead of the big download all at once. That said, we want to reduce the number of downloads. So we don't wanna just put all of our components into little tiny JavaScript files. We remember there's an overhead on a mobile device for each download. So an old, an, a common technique for images is image spriting. Instead of downloading these three marker images, we can put them all in one image, image and crop them in the browser using divs. With, the, with JavaScript, we wanna, after we've split things into our modules, we wanna then combine them back together. When we know that two components are going to always be used together, they're better off being served as one. When we started bundling some of our modules, we saw huge latency improvements on the mobile devices. So instead of downloading three requests for 15 to 25 kilobytes, we want to just download one that's 57 kilobytes. This is in the, the um, example of our API. Now, caching is one of our favorite techniques for reducing latency, not having to make a round trip to the server, just accessing data from the browser's cache. But mobiles are far more constrained than desktops when it comes to caching. There are file size restrictions, 
the total size of the cache is limited, and maybe most importantly, they're cleared much more frequently. For example, on the iPhone, when you close every tab in Safari and close Safari, it clears the cache. For our API, we really depend on caching. We, we expect that, because the API is quite popular, that people may visit one site and download the, the JavaScript and tiles, and then when they visit another site, those files and images are already in their cache or in some cache near them, a server cache near them. With, the, with mobile, we can no longer depend on that. We need to make things fast as if they're always downloading our files for the first time. Fortunately, the cache, as well as the parsing time for JavaScript, the cache is also improving with each OS and hardware release. A year ago, we were seeing things that the iPhone could, could cache up to 20 items of no more than 25 kilobytes uncompressed in its cache. Now we're, we're caching many more files and many larger files. Things are looking up. Um, next, though, you can, as an alternative to the cache, if you can't count on that, that data being there, there's the HTML5 database. It's great for static files because it allows you to store data for your site on the phone itself. It's not great for dynamic content, however, and it's not easy to use cross-domain. So for our API, we've looked into it, and it doesn't make much sense for us because we're always changing our versions and we're running cross-domain. Everything we do is cross-domain. That um, not the solution for us, but a great idea for regular applications out there on the web. So now I'll share with you some of the, the architecture choices we've made to reduce latency. We recall that, that it took to download that initial map 175 kilobytes of uncompressed JavaScript and six images. There's two things we need to improve there. We would like to request fewer images, we'd, and we'd like to request them earlier. The way that our API works, we need the, the, full API, the full interface to download, that full library to download, with all of the classes and methods the developer can call. And then once that has downloaded, they can create a, the developer can create a map set the center and zoom and map type, and at that point, we can start downloading images. That's a lot to happen. And because that interface to get just a, to create a GMAP2 and set center and set zoom, that needs to come with a full 175 kilobytes. And we've made this promise to developers of this large synchronous public interface. There's a lot of classes and a lot of methods in the API and many of them, when you call some method, you expect some other piece of data available right then synchronously. So changing that contract was really our, our real limitation. Um, the, the, so the full sequence here of what happens, we download what we call the bootstrap. This is what then specifies what version, either specified or the latest version of the API is that we're going to download. Then we download that full interface library then we download the rest of the, the users or the developers page. We then need to wait for the map to be initialized, and at that point we can load images. Then we load everything else, the drag initialization or the controls, other things on the, on the map. So we need to, to make that last blue part, that load images, much earlier or um, shrink the size of those steps before it. And that was our goal in developing Maps API v3. What we chose to do is use a model view controller architecture, MVC. In this, this pattern, the models store state synchronously, and that's all they do. We then have views that are, that are responsible for rendering that state, and that can all be done asynchronously, meaning they can all be downloaded later in the, in the pipeline. We then have controllers that are go-betweens between them. I won't spend too much time talking about them. So our initial download in V3 only contains these models. And then the views and the controllers are loaded on demand. This means that if you never create a marker, we only have put a few hundred bytes in the API that just give you the interface for the marker, but no actual marker functionality. So it looks like this. Here's an example of the marker. Oh, and the, so the, the models that we put in that first download are things like the map, the marker, the info window. Those are all examples of models. If you've developed with B3, you're familiar with these classes. They are simple, 
what we call MVC objects that set and get properties and do nothing else. So with the marker, it has a position. It's in lat long space. The view works in pixel space, and all it does is render things in the DOM. But that's the, the bulk of the code with the marker, is calculating where it should be positioned in the DOM and styling it correctly and, and all the things that go along with, with creating image elements. We have a controller that sits between these two things that converts between the lat long space and the pixel space, meaning that this view is totally independent of anything having to do with the map. It really, we could have this marker view be totally unrelated to a map, or say, put it in a street view object, um, and render it exactly the same, because all it does is render images in a div. So, and this works on an event-based system. So when we set the position on the, the marker, on the marker model, it then triggers an event to the position controller. The position controller has the right inputs to convert that from a lat long to a pixel position. It then sets its own pixel position, which triggers an event on the marker view, and the marker view can then position itself in the DOM. This means that as the developer, you called set position. We then did all this behind the scenes stuff, which was all asynchronous, you don't really care. You'll then get notified if we change the position again with one of those same events. But there's no need to have a lot of synchronous um, functionality here. So, in the end, the marker is very small, having limited, just setters and getters, limited functionality, and you get events when things do change. So the next thing we need to optimize, this, and this, uh, the, the MVC architecture allowed us with a, a, an interface almost as large as V2s to reduce that 175 kilobytes uncompressed to 32 kilobytes uncompressed, which compressed is about 11 or 12 kilobytes that you download in order for us to get your center, your zoom, your map type, so that we can start rendering the map. The other thing that we have living in our main.js that we call it, that first download, the big one, is code to render a single map tile. We use our static map server that when you set the center and the zoom and the map type, because you can do that once you download that first component, that main.js, once you've set those, we contact our static map server, get a map to fit exactly your div, and load that one first, and then fill in on top of it the regular tiles that allow for the infinite zooming. So instead of downloading, to get that map to appear initially, instead of downloading six images of about 25 kilobytes each, we download one image that's 40 kilobytes. This cuts a few seconds off of our load time. It brings what would be probably seven to eight seconds down to four or five seconds to load uh, to, for that user perceived latency on a mobile device. Now it's great to study this in a controlled environment and to study latency. We also, um, it's very important for us to measure this in the real world. We track how long our maps take so that we can see the impact of certain changes on our on the on latency and see what our, our users are actually experiencing. See when things make it, see when changes make it better and see when it makes it worse. So we see here in a few months time we saw our, our small maps get faster and our big maps maybe get slower. Um, this graph that I'm showing you, the, the upper lines have very little traffic compared to the lower line. So it's hard to know exactly what's going on but this shows us we need to spend more time with big maps on an iPhone, perhaps. Another way to reduce latency is to prefetch. That when you know a user is going to do something and they're going to do something soon, to prefetch that data, to load it in the background so it's ready when you want to use it. This is great for latency. Remember, though, it can be bad for users, particularly users not in the US. They may have limited or expensive data, and they don't really like it when, when sites start downloading a lot of stuff in the background. It can also slow down other things that are going on in the site. So prefetch pre with caution, prefetch when it is highly likely that somebody's going to want to use this content. With that, I'm gonna turn over the mic to Mark Rede, my colleague on the, the Maps API v3 team, who's going to take you through some of the technologies that we've been studying and using. Okay. So, technology. I'm going to talk to you about graphics, geolocation, and touch and mouse events. Graphics technology, you have 
quite a range of graphics technology available. There is uh, scalar vector graphics, uh, VML, there is Canvas, Canvas 2D, Canvas 3D, there is CSS Transform. The problem with those technologies is really that you haven't got all of them on every browser. You have a mix of support between browsers, you have a mix of support between operating systems. Um, touch events and mouse events are supported on some browsers and not on others. So you have to adapt. You, you, th the main point is that you're gonna have to create different paths for your sites, different ways of rendering things, and take the most appropriate one depending on the type of browsers that you're facing. So we use graphics, a lot of graphics intensive capabilities in the police, in Street View, and in some of our controls, the compass control, for example. So I'm gonna talk about some of those things. And I'm gonna go through and trying to give you a bit of an idea of where these different technology fits, what the good things and the bad things are about them, and uh, where they are supported. So let's start with scalar vector graphics. So scalar vector graphics is great for rendering polyline, polygons, uh, 2D uh, vector information. It's quite fast. Um, it, it has a lot of advantages. It's retained mode, which means that if you load data into an SVG control, it will remember it. And if you need to modify the thickness of a line, you just find that line element, change the thickness attribute, and the display will be changed. It's quite fast once the model is loaded. Uh, because it's DOM-based, it actually has very good uh, mouse uh, event support. So if you click on an, a sub-element of an SVG control, you'll get a click event that tells you exactly which element has been clicked. So if you have a number of polygons on your screen and you click on one, it will tell you that that particular polygon has been clicked and it gives you the location on the polygon. So all this is great. Good mouse support, good DOM support, good fast support for polyline polygon. Um, the trade-off is that if you want to work with images, well, it's not really designed to work with images. You can do transforms for images, but the performance is really a bit bad. Um, it's also opaque to mouse events, so if you have a very large SVG control, you can't really receive mouse events behind it, even if it's transparent. So that also creates some problems if you place an SVG element in the middle of your screen. Support-wise, it's supported by uh, Firefox by uh, Safari by Chrome, um, but it's not supported by Android and it's not supported by Internet Explorer. So for Internet Explorer, well, you have VML. They, they both appeared about the same time. I don't remember which one came first, and I don't know if it's Microsoft that decided to make a, a different SVG or SVG simplified VML. Not sure. I think there's some arguments there. But they work the same way. The syntax is a bit different, but they're both dumb based they both retain mode, they both have similar mouse support. So in a sense, uh, what we find in our code is we have a lot of common code between SVG and VML. And when we detect that it's IE, we render the information in VML. When we detect that it's not IE, we render it in SVG. So very similar programming pattern there. Um, the nice thing about VML and SVG is that you can either create that data uh, through JavaScript, create elements, and then set the attributes. Or you can directly create uh, a lot of HTML, uh, a string that defines your whole SVG of VML element and load that into your browser. So you can pre-prepare the data server side and feed it as part of your page. So when you have to do more image-intensive work, you left with Canvas. So Canvas 2D. It's fairly fast for manipulating images. You can transform images, you can crop images, so quite good. Um, it's not really designed to do polyline and polygons. It can do it, but the problem with Canvas is that it's not retained mode. So it means that if I draw 100 polygons, I have to make thousands of calls to SVG to say, uh, sorry, to Canvas to say, start here, draw there, draw there, draw there, draw there, draw there, and so on, and move there and draw again, and move there and draw again. If I want to change one small attribute or the position of one point, it's like a piece of paper. Erase everything and draw the whole thing again. So you don't really have the capability of being able to modify a small part of your canvas. The other part is, because it's a big piece of paper, you have no mouse support, uh, in a sense that if somebody clicks on the canvas, you'll get a message that says, the canvas has been clicked, and this is the XY position. If you've got 100 polygons that had been drawn, you're gonna have to find in JavaScript which polygon was clicked based on the XY. You're gonna have to do your own heat test. There's no support in Canvas for, uh, event, for click event support. 
Um, Browser-wise, it's well supported. Only Internet Explorer doesn't support it, so um, it, it's not bad. Um, performance is, uh, really depends on browser and on operating systems. I'll show you later a table of uh, the statistics I extracted in my work on Street View, and you'll see that you can't take things for granted, even when you look at a single browser and think that the performance is going to be the same across all operating systems, it's really not the case. So if you have to do something fast, do it in Canvas 3D. Well, that would be great, um, but it's only supported on Natly Build at the moment. But it's fast. It's, it is extremely fast. Um, it's retain mode. You load all your geometry in WebGL, and you can access it. You can modify it. You don't really have to continuously, like in Canvas 2D, redraw everything. The mouse support is just as bad as Canvas 2D. You will know that your canvas has been clicked, but you don't really know where it's been clicked. So it, it has its, its good and its bad. Now, CSS transform, uh, it, it, it's, it doesn't completely belong in this category, but you can apply CSS transform on DOM element to do animation and to do a bit of transform. So if you don't really need to draw things, but you just need to transform some of your element, look into CSS transform. It's great for animations. You can do CSS-based animation instead of modifying the position of your elements, and you can time them. So you just by setting a style with a timing and a start end position, you can create animations in CSS transform. It, that, that will be really fast. OK. Um, so what's happening there, really, is that you end up with a code that has the IE path, VML and HTML, and then the rest of the world. Maybe it will change with IE9, but for the moment, you really end up with a, a, a dual-type approach for your uh, graphics. So this is the table of rendering. So when, when I render Street View, uh, every time you pan, I have to render a, a complete frame. It's a lot of image cropping, a lot of image transformations. It's thousands of cores into Canvas. So this is really pushing Canvas to the limit. It's, if you have to draw a few polygons and things like that, you'll never have this kind of problem. But if you start having to do thousands of calls to Canvas, this is the kind of performance you're going to be looking at. Um, so as you can see, uh, Chrome on Linux, Chrome on Windows, Firefox on Linux, um, Safari on MacBook and Windows, Performance is not bad, okay, from 25 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. It's acceptable. It gives fairly good panning. But then um, Chrome on Mac, uh, Firefox on Mac, Firefox on Windows, the performance there is just unusable. You, if you start having five frames per second or two frames per second, just you can't really do any panning or any animation on this kind of thing. Um, I've put here the iPad and iTouch figures. Um, so iPad at 800 milliseconds and iTouch at 1900 milliseconds. So you get uh, a frame every two seconds. Um, same thing, not usable. And the new uh, Froyo is at 340 milliseconds. So it's still, what, six times faster than the iTouch, but not quite uh, usable if you want to do image intensive work. So in the case, in this situation, what we've done with Street View, is that for Linux, window, for Linux Chrome and Linux Windows, we actually use the um, Canvas 2D uh, implementation. And for everybody else, you, we use the HTML4 implementation, which I will demonstrate shortly. Now, WebGL, that's where it gets exciting. These are the timing for the same work done in WebGL. So rendering a frame in WebGL on Chrome Linux, 0 0.9 millisecond. Rendering the same frame on Safari WebGL, 1.5 millisecond. Rendering it on Firefox, on Windows XP, 1.1 millisecond. Okay, so at that level, just the performance, the, the user interface is smooth. It's all done in JavaScript, talking to WebGL, but it's really nice. You really have great performance. And I just can't wait to have WebGL just coming out directly in, uh, in mainstream. OK, so what, what we ended up using? Uh, for polygons and polylines, uh, SVG and VML uh, for most browsers, we fall back to Canvas for Android because there's no SVG and VML support. For animation, we use CSS transforms. Uh, we have no animation on IE. For image transformation, we use Canvas. And we have no image transformation on IE and on um, Android. 
And for 3D Transform, when it's there, we'll be using WebGL. Um, I'm hoping it's coming soon. I haven't heard about anything from IE9, so I wouldn't hold my breath either. Okay, so let me show you a, a couple of demos. And what I'm trying to, to show you there is that those technologies can be mixed. So where am I? Uh, so when we looked at this view here, what's happening is we have, it's hard to see on the white car there. Okay, so what I've got there is I've got a links control. That links control is an SVG control. I've got mouse support, I can do rollovers, I can change the style, that's my SVG control. I've got another SVG control here, which is my compass control, so I can rotate things when my view changes. And then on the background, uh, I actually have here an HTML4 layer for Street View, because the performance on Chrome Macintosh for Canvas 2D was too, wasn't good enough. So if I switch to the WebKit Safari, which is the night build, that's a similar view, but here, the performance, that's WebGL, okay? This is uh, this kind of thing, you know? You, that's the kind of thing you're gonna be able to do with WebGL. So what I've got there is I've got a background which is WebGL, but on top of that background, I still have the SVG control for my links, and the SVG control for my compass. So you mix the technology and use the one that best fits what you need to do, okay? So if we switch to Please. this little guy, uh, sorry. Come on. Ah, there. Yeah. Okay. So if we switch to this little guy, we have the same thing. Um, and here, it's actually an HTML background. And the links control that we can hardly see under the zoom button, but the links control is actually a canvas control. And canvas doesn't support text rendering, so actually we didn't put the text. It's also a small display, so we didn't really have the, the space to fit the text for the streets. And, but because canvas doesn't have mouse support, what I've got on top of that uh, canvas control is I've got transparent div that have been CSS transformed. So they follow, the, they follow on top of the arrows. So when you click on the arrows, you're not click, clicking the canvas control, you're clicking some transparent div. So just think about all these things and think about how you can uh, mix and match the different technologies. Uh, let's go back to... No, it's gone. Sorry. Okay, so uh, a, a few things to also remember. Canvas 2D performance will increase every time your canvas size increase. So you've got a number of problems. One is when the canvas is bigger, you tend to make more call. In our case, make more call to canvas. Um, you have more pixels to render for the engine. And those two things combined means that it really gets slow. It, it, it gets more than linearly worse. So you don't want to use canvas on a, a very large desktop and just draw all over the place. It's, the, the performance is not going to be good. Um, there are a number of bugs with those technologies. So for example, iPhone has a, a bug where you combine 3D transforms with touch events. So things that you have to choose sometime in different technologies. Uh, Canvas, up until Froyo, had no support for images on Canvas. There was a bug there. That's been fixed with Froyo this week, so uh, it, it's good news. Uh, WebGL only supported on Night Build. And um, there is bugs when you enable uh, CSS transform events with uh, the support for embedded objects. So if you try to combine uh, having a, a flash object and putting CSS transform to position it in a different location, you're not going to get a very good result. So um, just be aware of all these things. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, I'll be very quick on geolocation. The reason I want to be very quick on it is really it's not difficult. Um, it's been covered in a number of sessions today, but the, the point to take home is that 
If you want to do geolocation, use the W3C implementation. It's available in Firefox, it's available on mobile devices. And if you don't have the w 3 if you don't have geolocation available built into the device, fall back to Google Gears. The two objects have the same interface. So if you have that little piece of code in your application, you can just look at if you have the geolocation available or if you have Google Gears available and then just do your request, okay? Um, we don't provide it at the moment as part of the API simply because it's just a few lines of code you can put yourself. We use it as part of uh, a preview we'd have seen a, a few days uh, yesterday on the Place API. So mouse and touch event. Uh, it's, not for, it's not a very good news for mobiles at the moment. So there is very good support for touch event on the iPhone, iPad, iTouch. Um, there is fairly good support for touch event on Android. I mean, fairly good because there is no support at the moment for pinch type event. Um, and then after that, there is very much nothing. Um, we've tested the S60, we've tested Palm OS, we've tested a number of other devices, and up until now, those events are not available. So when you interact with the browser, you can see that the browser will scale when you pinch or will react, but the fact is, at the JavaScript level, you're not getting those events. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, the, the sequence of events you're getting is also a bit uh, different for each of the browser. So you're gonna have to be careful in your code. Uh, some browsers are gonna swap the sequence of events. They're gonna give you click events and not give you mouse events, or they're gonna give you mouse events and not click events. So mobile technology at the moment, there isn't that much of a standard, and you're gonna have to test every devices as you go. This is, at the moment, what, what the, the world looks like for, for events. So there is very good support for iPhone, iPad. There is good support on Android. And on the Samsungs, the Palm OS, the Nokia we've tested, there's just click events. Um, the Nokia is doing a, a, something quite weird where they simulate mouse hover when you touch the screen. So if you touch your screen on a Nokia browser, it will give you a mouse uh, hover event. And when you move a mouse, move then a mouse out. And then when you let go, it will give you a sequence of mouse up, mouse down, mouse click. So it makes for things a bit difficult. Um, Okay, let's talk about debugging. Um, Susan had just brushed a bit about it. So debugging on desktop on the iPhone and Android. Debugging on desktop, really, uh, 10 years of uh, development have done things fairly well. We use Firefox on, uh, sorry, Firebug on Firefox, a visual debugger in the developer toolbar on the Internet Explorer. Um, we use the develop console and speed tracker. If you haven't heard about speed tracker, find the recording of the Chrome sessions this week, uh, that were on yesterday and today and learn about speed tracker. It's really a great tool. And uh, Safari with the web inspector. Now, what do you do on the iPhone? Uh, Susanna brushed on it. So <laughs> there isn't much. You do some uh, console tracking and you enable the debugger mode on Safari and get uh, a few lines of text. It's a bit annoying, but that's all you're gonna be able to do. If you want to do some performance testing, uh, research the use of the iPhone configuration utility. That will let you uh, set proxy settings on your 3G settings. So you launch the iPhone configuration utility, find the advanced settings, set up the proxy, and set that configuration onto your phone and then all your HTTP traffic will go to a proxy server. If you've got a Windows, proxy, a Windows machine, you install Fiddler on it, enable it to become a, an external proxy, you will get the kind of charts that this is giving you. Okay, so you'll be able to find the start time, the end time, the duration of all your transfers. You'll be able to see the, um, the request header and response header of all the requests you've made. So that allows you to monitor all your AJAX queries to look at what you were sending and receiving. So it's a great debugging tool for AJAX style application. If you want to do the same thing on Android, a um, bit more difficult on some, it's simply on others. Uh, to do tracking, the best way is to plug in your Android into a USB port and run the ADB utility on your desktop. So go and download the Android SDK, uh, install the USB drivers that the, U, that the SDK will uh, prompt you to install, and then launch the ADB Logcat application. 
when you plug in your Android on your PC, it will automatically stream all the information that the Android is uh, uh, displaying directly on the text console. So you'll get information on the inside of the Android, a lot of track information, but uh, among all of this, you'll see all the HTTP trace. So great tool. Um, to do HTTP proxy, simply go to the network settings of your Android and uh, find your network access point names. And under each access point name, you can go to the settings and add the proxy value. So if you, if you set a proxy and a port, same thing, you can get all your 3G traffic to be redirected to a proxy, a fiddler proxy, and get all the queries that you're making. So quite nice. Um, this was broken in 2.1, but I think it's being fixed in for you. Okay, that's the end of our presentation. But we would like to remind you that uh, you can get qualified as a Google developer. So uh, to be recognized for your, your work as a, a developer and your expertise. And we will now be taking questions both from the floor and from Wave. Um, Go to this one to no. give them the... Well, they have the link there. So. The two. So have you got any question? I can also answer some Street View questions if you're interested. Have you come up with uh, any recommendations aside from what we had last year for clustering large uh, amounts of markers? Um, use KML. KML? Yes. Um, uh, if, even for a small amount of geometry, I think uh, past 50, um, 50 markers, you're going to find that uh, 50 markers or info windows or polyline, things like that, KML will give you better performance. You can so. also check out the marker clusters that are available online, including one that the guy in the front row here wrote. So. Yeah. Uh, do you have any suggestions for measuring um, like CPU load of the browser? Sometimes you know, it's easy to measure you know, JavaScript pausing or running too long, but Sometimes you know, different ways of rendering things take more. Have you, looked, have you looked at Speed Tracker? Uh, no, not deeply, actually. But OK, so Speed Tracker will give you information on CPU usage for everything in the browser on Chrome. Awesome. So it will tell you how much CPU to the millisecond is spent on parsing, on rendering, uh, on, on doing a server request. So it's a, it's a very good tool for that, in particular, um, it, it will highlight to you if you have uh, combinations of, um, if you have some bad JavaScript that continuously modify DOM elements. So you, you have a loop where you set attributes and do something else, set attributes, do something else, and it will show you that the browser is, is continuously doing render, update, render, update, render, update. And it will help you identify this kind of uh, performance hits. So speed Tracker will go to the, to the CPU level to show you um, where all the time is spent in executing JavaScript. Cool. Uh, do you know, any, does anything in the IE do that? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, actually. Is there anything to affect the scale of a marker um, in uh, the MAPS v3 API? Um, yes, there's a, um, there's a new parameter in marker image called scale image that will let you scale a marker. Yeah, okay. um, uh, have a look at the documentation, and I've got a blog post that explains a bit how it's done as well. Cool. Uh, I was also going to say that you mentioned that there was really no alternative to debugging on a certain platform to, then other than uh, just saying console.log. Um, you could always just put things to the page itself, because I have personal experience with not liking that, because if you don't homogenize that object or leave a console log in there. It breaks it for many browsers that don't have that there. So just a word of advice if anybody has had that issue. Yeah. Yeah, it, yes, we also use that technique from time to time, particularly yeah. when we need to go back and, and debug things also on IE6 and yeah, um, anything that doesn't have a, to the page. a console. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. OK for debugging, but it affects performance. So if you're trying to do performance tests, it's, it's a bit of a problem because you cause the browser to re-render or to reprocess its DOM. And, we can take this question from the wave. Um, is there a feature plan for V3 that covers similar functionality to maplets? Um, not currently, 
but the issue tracker is your friend. Yes. Hi there. I, I have a question about the zooming support built into mobile browsers, pinch zoom or press the little buttons. Did you try and make use of any of those or just disable them totally? What did you do when it came across uh, the zooming support that's built into browsers and how you handled that? So we disable the, the default, um, or we, we cancel the default events for the touch events so that we don't, uh, so that we don't scale the page when you're in the map. So as long as your, your pinch is inside the map, we won't scale, or your drag is inside the map, we won't drag the page through. And I think it's just, it's either cancel or stop propagation or. You know, that, that's only for the iPhone, obviously, because for the other browsers, you don't get that event, so you have no capability of canceling it. Um, you well, can. Well, Android, you get it, but just not for pinch. Yeah. But same thing for your drag. You can set some meta tags at the top of your page to restrict zooming altogether. So for our test pages, in particular, for, it, it's quite standard for the iPhone to set the tag at the top to say min, min zoom, max zoom is one, and no user zooming, and so on. And that stops the pinching from having a zoom effect if you want the UI to stay always the same size. And for a, a full screen web app, you would most likely want that feature. In fact, the map will render best when the scale is set and you don't allow. Once you start um, uh, scaling a page on a desktop or on the mobile, we get artifacts between tiles and um, just it's, it's life kind of with the, with the browsers. <laughs> I think one more question. Um, do you have any plans to support uh, middle mouse scroll zoom sensitivity? Like for example, using the Apple Magic Mouse on uh, the MacBooks or I mean, or anything. It's really sensitive so it causes the zoom to just. We've seen that, haven't we? Yeah. I think we've observed that. <coughs> File an a issue in the issue tracker. It's something that, that we should probably fix on the, on the MacBook. Just haven't prioritized it yet. We're using more MacBooks now, so you can expect that. You know, that might happen sooner now that it's in our daily life. <laughs> Sorry, one more. Uh, have you guys been uh, telling PPK of Quirks Mode about your findings with these events on different mobile phones? I'm sure he'd be interested or getting them from him. We have not talked to him. We look at his stuff sometime. Yeah, he has an <laughs> extensive chart of all this stuff. Yeah. I'm sure he'd be really happy if you told him of this stuff or just linked him to this presentation because he keeps a big master table that a lot of people use for um, compatibility. So. Yeah, we refer to that one. So. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, and good luck developing your, your cross-platform web applications. We look forward to seeing them. Thank you.